Professor Asher Sassar, please. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, good morning to you all. And uh, I am uh, very privileged to be at this uh, Gendel Forum uh, at the university again this year. Um, my, I would say, rather telegraphic presentation uh, on the, uh, the Middle East and how ISIS has come into being uh, will be just outlining a number of, uh, of key points that I think have brought us uh, to where we are. Uh, and where we are is in an unprecedented situation of uh, internal disintegration of some very key Arab states. Uh, not necessarily those that people might have expected uh, to have gone in this direction. But the Arab world is in a, a huge uh, crisis. The crisis is mainly related uh, to socioeconomic matters, where I think it would be fair to say that the last 200 years in which the Arab world has tried to go through a process of Western-style modernization uh, has not been very successful. The Arab world has a population that it cannot sustain. In the year 2000, the population of all the Arab countries, that is from Morocco in the west to the Gulf states in the east, the Arab states had a population of 280 million. That is 2000. Presently, 2015, it is 370 million. And in 2025, it will be 460 million. Even though uh, growth rates are declining, it is still a huge number of people who are having less children than before. But that does not turn off the growth rate completely. The Arab world would have to find in the next 10 years something like 50 million, 60 million jobs. The United States couldn't do that. The Arab world certainly won't. And it's just a question hovering over the region. Who will provide for these people? Uh, jobs, uh, money, uh, water. And as a result, you have the uh, Arab world going through this process of revolution, civil war, and mass emigration. If the region cannot sustain its population, people are going to have to emigrate in increasing numbers, and you can see that. I mean, it's taking place in the countries where you all live. <clears throat> this crisis of the Arabs, as one could call it, is a result of the great failure in the 20th century of the Arab nationalist movement, that movement of pan-Arabism, that movement of which Gamal Abdel Nasser of Egypt of the 1950s and 60s, as you will recall, was the great hero. And Nasser had this messianic message of power and prestige and prosperity that came to naught. The failure of Arab nationalism was also, and more importantly for the world we see around us now, the failure of Arab nationalism was also the failure of the platform of secular and secularizing politics in the Arab world. Arab nationalism, in theory at least, is a secular ideology. Arab nationalism talks about uniting the Arabs not on the basis of their religion, but on the basis of the language they speak. Muslims and Christians are all Arabs, at least in theory. And this was the first really major effort to secularize the peoples of the Middle East. And the failure of Arab nationalism is also the failure of this platform of secularism. And the constant retreat from secular politics ever since. These are societies that were never really fully secularized at no time. And I won't go through what I call the resilience of tradition. Tradition has been far more resilient than all the reformers and sociologists and political scientists of the West imagined uh, in the Middle East. But the fact of the matter is, 
that this resilience of tradition has led <coughs> to the rise very emphatically in the last 50 years or so of Islamist politics. Now here I want to make a distinction between Sunni Muslims and Shiite Muslims. The Sunnis, most of the Arabs are Sunnis. But there are important Shiite minorities uh, in the region. One of these is actually the majority of the people of Iraq. Iraq is actually a Shiite majority country. But the most important Shiite country is not an Arab country, but Iran. And therefore, when you look at the, at the manner in which Sunni Islamic radicalism has been expressed and Shiite Islamic radicalism, the dogmas have a political impact, which I would argue is advantageous to Iran and disadvantageous to the Arabs. And it's one of the explanations for Iranian gain and hegemonic uh, advance in the last uh, few years. Sunni Arab radicalism tends to emphasize the law, the implementation of Islamic law, the Sharia. That's what Sunni radicals talk about. But it has invariably been very vague in Sunni political thinking. Who is supposed to implement this implementation of the Sharia? What political body? How is this body supposed to come into being? Who is going to see to this implementation? There is no centralized papal authority that rules on such matters. If you look around the Sunni world today, Iraq and Syria and the disintegration, particularly in the Syrian civil war, it looks like the Hobbesian war of all against all. There is no central authority. There are scores of these Islamic militias, sometimes fighting together, sometimes fighting with each other. But it's a very dis diffuse, disorganized, decentralized militancy all over the Middle East. Shiite radicalism also speaks, of course, about the implementation of the law. I mean, Muslim society is not Muslim if it isn't governed by the law, the same way as some Jewish people would argue that Israel cannot be Jewish unless it's governed by the halakha. It's the same argument. Shiite radicalism emphasizes the character of the ruler. And Shiite radicalism calls for the guardianship of the jurist. The ayatollah must be the ruler. And once it is agreed amongst the religious leadership who this particular ayatollah will be, there is a centralized authority. Centralized and respected as a spiritual um, institution. Therefore, in the Shiite world, there is a much greater centralized subservience of the various Shiite minorities to Iran as the ruling power and as the guiding political force. The Iranians have authority, influence, and indeed control over organizations like Hezbollah in Lebanon or the variety of Shiite militias in Iraq. It is these Shiite militias in Iraq under Iranian inspiration who are pushing ISIS back in Iraq. They are the ones who are doing it. And you have now, as, you, as I'm sure you've heard, these Shiites in Yemen, the Houthis, who are also pretty much under Iranian influence and direction. So you have a very diffuse Sunni world trying to contend with a very organized, centralistic Shiite competitor. But probably the main reason for the Iranian advantage is Iraq. The American war in Iraq in 2003. The unintended consequences of that war. By invading Iraq and overthrowing Saddam Hussein as evil as he was, Saddam's regime was a Sunni regime. 
Saddam's regime was the imposition by force, by cruelty, by this uh, Republic of Fear, as it was called, of Sunni supremacy over a Shiite majority population. By removing Saddam Hussein, the United States empowered the Shiite majority of Iraq. Iraq ceased to be the Sunni-dominated gatekeeper of the Arab East. And instead of being the gatekeeper of the Arab East, keeping Iran at bay, Iraq became an Iranian province of influence. And handing over Iraq to the Shiites was more or less handing over Iraq to the Iranians, who now had what King Abdullah of Jordan called the Shiite crescent of influence. Iran, Iraq, Syria, and Hezbollah in Lebanon. That is, Iranian influence from Tehran to the Mediterranean, the likes of which never existed in the modern Middle East. It is against that background that ISIS came into being. ISIS was first established as Al-Qaeda in Iraq. It was the Sunni opposition in Iraq to this new Shiite domination. And Al-Qaeda in Iraq became the Islamic State in Iraq. And then when the Syrian civil war broke out, they expanded into Syria and became the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria, ISIS. There is some confusion in English. Uh, it's sometimes called ISIS and sometimes called ISIL. It's the same thing. It's just a different way of translating the Arabic. When they speak of Syria, ISIS, they don't speak of Syria. They speak of what they call Sham. Bilada Sham. Sham is greater Syria. They don't recognize the boundaries that the imperialists created between Syria and Lebanon and uh, Eretz Israel and Jordan, etc. So they speak about the Islamic State in Iraq and Sham. Sham is translated sometimes as Syria and therefore ISIS, sometimes translated perhaps more correctly as the Levant and therefore ISIL. But it's the, it, the Arabic is always the same, just the English that is confusing itself. And it is this ISIS founded in order to resist Shiite advantage that is breaking up the border zone between Iraq and Syria, keeping Iraq a very divided state and essentially dismantling Syria in the civil war that is taking place there between the Sunni majority who are now trying to unseat another minority that was in control of Syria, the Alawi minority. The Alawis are a small breakaway sect from Shia won't go into the details, but they're on Iran's side. And the Sunni majority, always dispossessed in Syria of the last half century, have risen in rebellion against this Alawi minority. The fight, therefore, that ISIS fights is, in a very strange kind of way, the same fight that other opponents of the regime in Syria are fighting. So when the United States fights against ISIS, it is doing what Iran is doing and is doing what Assad is doing. So the Americans want Assad to leave, but take actions including last night that serve Assad's regime. The Iranians are essentially kicking ISIS out of Iraq they're doing the United States a favor. And the United States is essentially indirectly cooperating with Iran on this particular issue. And here I will say in conclusion a few words about the US policy. There is, I would say, a measure of confusion between two different matters. What governs foreign policy? Interests or values? Values. 
And American foreign policy seems to be constantly antagonistic to itself within these two sets of considerations. Do you relate to the Egyptian regime as a military regime that conducted a coup d'etat and is therefore undemocratic and not an ally? Or is the new regime in Egypt the ally of the United States because it is putting down the Muslim brethren and it is not friendly towards Iran and it keeps the peace with Israel? And at times the US policy is pro and at times it is against. And again, the inconsistency about dealing with ISIS on the one hand and not serving uh, the interests of Assad and the Iranians on the other. But here I think there is an explanation also for the, the gap between how Israel and the Sunni Arab countries understand Iran and the present uh, US administration. There seems to be a growing understanding on the American side that this powerful Iran, this hegemonic Iran, this Iran that is so uh, more uh, stable than uh, many of the Arab players, this Iran is a partner for the running of the Middle East of the future. Whereas Israel and the Sunni states see Iran not as the partner but as the problem. And therefore there is this growing, I would say, daylight, as you say, in the American uh, discourse between the administration that seems to increasingly see Iran as one that must establish an agreement with on the nuclear issue and come to some kind of partnership in the uh, managing of the rather disorderly affairs of the Middle East and those like Israel and the Saudis and others in the region who see Iran not as the partner of the future but as the problem of the future. Thank you.